Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Today we'll be discussing identity and context virtualization, taking a look at how the right mix of meta directory and virtual directory is changing the way we manage identities. With us this morning is Andras Chair, a senior analyst at Forrester Research, where he focuses on identity and access management, user account provisioning, entitlement management, federation, enterprise fraud, and role design and management. We've also got Lisa Grady with us today. Lisa's been in the virtual directory space for more than 10 years, working with customers as an SE, and she's now the product evangelist here at Radiant Logic. A couple of things before we get started. We are muting everyone's phone line during the presentation to cut down on background noise. So if you have any questions for our panelists, please submit them in the question pane, and we'll cover as many as we can in the Q&A process at the end of the, uh, the session. We'll also be doing some polling during today's webinar. When a poll question comes up, you'll have around 20 seconds to submit your answer. All right, let's get started. Here's Andras Chair of Forrester Research to kick things off today. Andras? Thank you. Um, this is Andras, and today's talk is really about trying to understand how we can find the right mix between uh, meta directories and virtual directories. And, and really, uh, in our IT inquiries with uh, various uh, uh, high-level people, C-level people, CISOs, C uh, CSOs, in inquiries, we very often hear about a pressing need uh, to consolidate directory infrastructures. So basically, uh, almost 20% uh, of our inquiries really is about how to do uh, directory consolidation, how we can do it, how we can centralize management of, of directories, active directories, LDAP, and, and various other uh, user repositories. Uh, so basically, the need to pull in these functions and centralize these functions leads to a lot of benefits uh, in administri administering these directories and leads to a much higher data quality. The question is, how will we do this, uh, and, and will we do it right? So today, what I'd like to do is to spend a little bit of time talking about why directories are really important and challenging, what are some of the uh, benefits and directories of, of directory structures, and we're going to do a polling question around uh, whether how you use a matter of virtual directories. Then uh, talk a little bit about uh, the, the uh, benefits and then challenges of meta directories. What are, what are some of the use cases we see meta directories out there? What are some of the areas that we find them particularly useful? And then look into virtual directories. Uh, so look at again, uh, looking at again some of the benefits and, and then some of the challenges around them. Do some uh, polling around um, for your drivers and the organization why you're deploying. Uh, of these virtual directories, and then finally give you some some time tested recommendations, some nuggets that we've seen that worked for people uh, trying to work uh, with, with virtual directories and meta directories in the past. So, without further ado, let's get started and, and talk about why uh, directories are important and challenging. Uh, so, really, the first thing that that we see and, and hear about all the time that there's no life in a modern organization without uh, directories, really. Uh, it's mission-critical infrastructure, and then many people who get into managing directories kind of think about uh, um, these, these active directories or LDAP directories as, oh, well, this is just another piece of middleware. And very soon, when they have their first, pers or first 10 outages, they realize that, hey, this is just as important, just as mission critical as my other pieces of infrastructure, things like my uh, network devices, things like my mission critical applications, my app servers, et cetera. So we can safely say that, that really directories are mission critical infrastructure which do have a lot of benefits, right? So basically, these are standardized instances. The whole um, LLAP uh, schema design, protocol, et cetera, are fairly well understood these days, fairly mature protocols. There's not a lot of surprises if you have applications going against uh, these, these uh, directory sources. You know, their authentication is usually LDAP v3 compliant, so there's not a lot of surprises there. Uh, people use these directories, Active Directory, or for external facing applications to sometimes uh, other LDAP sources to authenticate users against, right? Uh, there's always this question of authorization, how much authorization, business authorization information you should or should not put into your authentication directory. Um, a lot of times, the reality of the story is that people actually use these uh, directories to contain uh, authorization information for applications. 
And obviously, when you look at the cost of managing directories and the reuse of, of, uh, of directories, LDAP directories in general, you can safely conclude that it's a much lower cost of using a directory uh, when you compare it against uh, Anything else, right? So if you have an application that has their own, uh, that had its own uh, user store, it's usually more costly, more obscure to manage than an Active Directory or LDAP. Obviously, directories have standard objects in them. So basically, the object ID um, uh, convention is fairly well understood. There's no other surprises there. Really, uh, there's a number of objects that come built into the uh, directory. Uh, may be a Sun or Oracle or, or Microsoft Active Directory. So there's a fairly well understood universe of, of objects and object names for people, computers, objects, uh, printers, file shares, etc. Obviously, the, the LDAP design has been that it, the directories have been designed to be a hierarchical, so it's not a relational database, but instead a hierarchical uh, uh, tree. Obviously, the Behind the scenes implementation can be an uh, can be a relational database, but uh, for for the external view or for you know basically the end user the the view is always hierarchical and you can it's a tree huge it's a directory information tree setup uh, and and consequently searching in the directory is fairly fast. Um, and, and really, the searches have been optimized, and, and the search mechanisms have been optimized a great deal so that you can really uh, search these directories quite fast. Uh, when you look at uh, some, some of the uh, data that's contained in these directories, obviously users, computers, groups, printers, phones, and sometimes you know things like physical pieces of equipment like letters. Uh, and, and various other uh, provision devices, readers are are also contained in directories. Uh, a lot of times for internal employees, a lot of times for business users, business partners, and and it's safe to say that uh, you would not be able to use your mobile phone's uh, voicemail capabilities if there wasn't some level of an LDAP directory uh, in the background. So telco carriers are great users of, of directories as well as every. Every uh, operator, every company that provides any kind of an external website presence that really has a large number of users, you can be fairly sure that you're going to be looking at uh, some level of, of an LDAP directory infrastructure in the background. So why why are, why are LDAP directories and directories in general a challenge? Right. Uh, so one of the things that we see all the time is this technical issues. Performance uh, may not be where you want it to be. Indexing has been something that comes up all the time. In order to, to provide good performance, you need to re-index the directory every once in a while, uh, either automatically or, or uh, manually. Obviously, LDAP groups have been something that's a sore point of, of LDAP as a design. If you have more than 20 to 50,000 objects in an LDAP group, the performance of the directory can be such that it, it makes it very difficult to query and, and uh, slow in responses. So LDAP groups are basically something that have undergone a lot of challenges and have undergone a lot of improvement, but they're still not where they need to be. Obviously, there's a lot of different namespaces out there, uh, different uh, uh, parts of directories that you need to work on and different technologies. Obviously, it's a standardized infrastructure, but there's, there's a lot of differences between uh, the schema objects and schema object names when, uh, when it comes to Microsoft infrastructure versus uh, Sun or Oracle and IBM infrastructure. Uh, anytime you have a schema change, i.e., you try to change the structure and, and composition of the objects uh, or the directory information tree in general, uh, you're going to run into some huge challenges. So basically, if you have a directory that, that uh, just out there and has been used statically, but you have an application that needs to uh, authenticate against LDAP but requires a very specific schema design, you're going to face some challenges as to how to massage and modify your, your existing LDAP schema to support for this new application. And finally, integration with provisioning applications is something that has been fairly uh, difficult. Obviously, people understand this, but uh, to how to write to LDAP, how to read from LDAP, when it, when it comes to modifying containers uh, in LDAP and, and applying that to application-specific needs, there's still some issues around this. 
So see, these are some of the technical challenges our directories. Some of the people and process, or political uh, aspects of directories is that you really have a number of uh, uh, instances where all the directories are fairly difficult to manage, right? So when you have mergers and acquisitions, so you're trying to uh, encapsulate and put in and pull in a new uh, organization and their directory infrastructure to your own directory infrastructure, how you do this. When there's an internal reorganization and you may you may have a directory information tree that closely maps to your old organization, how do you do the reorganization and restructuring of the LDAP tree? Uh, I talked about centralization. A lot of people need to uh, move from this multi-domain, multi-forest approach in Active Directory towards this more single domain, single forest, or close, closer to, to having as few instances and as few forests and domains in Active Directory as possible and, and administer them centrally. And when you look at some of the people aspects, how people handle these ownership of, of uh, directories and attribute authority in large organizations as to who can make what change to uh, which attribute, right, is, is something that comes up all the time. We just call this attribute authority. Uh, as I said, who can make right changes to the directory and, and who can actually read what instances and read what attributes from a directory is also something that uh, that comes up all the time. And in a large organization, you really have to have uh, agreement on schema designs because you have a lot of different and may, in a lot of times uh, conflicting requirements, conflicting interests. You have to come to conclusions and come to compromises when it comes to schema design. So with that, uh, let's see uh, in the polling who is using what uh, kinds of directories here. So let's uh, uh, move, move to that. Thanks, Andres. I Remember, you've got 20 seconds to submit your answer here. Okay, so it's 45% of the people use uh, meta directories, and 19% of them use uh, virtual directories, and 16% use both, and 19% don't use any one of them. Okay, um, thank you. So having having looked at the, the, these results, right? Let's look at some of the some of the benefits and challenges of. Uh, of meta directories, right? And obviously, one of the reasons you're probably attending this webinar is that using meta directories, and you're facing some challenges and issues around uh, using these meta directories. So let's let's talk about some of the benefits of meta directories. Uh, really, uh, one of the biggest uh, things that the meta directories provide is that data is locally available. So you basically have an aggregated view of all the data, and, and you have, can have a much better performance than anything that is synchronized or virtual, uh, anything that's virtual and, and not synchronized. So, so the data is really synchronized and locally available with meta directories, the performance is usually better than anything else. Uh, it's fairly proven in mature technology. There's been a number of iterations in this space. Meta directories are probably like uh, it, it, it's something like a, 20 to, a 15 to 20 year old technology out here if you count various iterations here and they got a fairly good um, integration and connectivity to things like security incident monitoring provisioning and other uh, parts of, of the identity and, ac uh, and access management ecosystem and infrastructure what, what are some of the challenges of, of uh, meta directory so it's really uh, these products are, are fairly mature. There's not a lot of new product development. People uh, really rarely see new releases of meta directories coming out. Uh, and, and one of the biggest problems that we've, we've seen when talking to some, some IT clients here is that anytime you really have a new entity, a new backend source or a synchronized source added to a meta directory, uh, you really have to make sure that the meta directory is really recertified for that data load that you're going to pull in from from that new backend. So basically, anything that you that you want to represent in your virtual directory uh, from a backend repository needs to be recertified in the meta directory. And if you have a lot of directories or a lot of directories with sensitive information, this can come, become quite a problem. 
because of the synchronization mechanisms, uh, data can become out of sync. So you may not be storing the latest and greatest information in the meta directory that's in the back end. We've seen some replication issues. And, and obviously, uh, the disk space requirements may seem like they're negligible. But uh, a lot of instances, we see people trying to replicate huge, huge amounts of data across the organization. So managing that data and providing just the disk space for that data on the meta directory is, is really something that, that makes people think. Uh, obviously, you can only represent one schema or limited number of schemas. And if, it, and if you need to reconfigure the schema, well, good luck, right? It's, it's fairly difficult. So because of these kinds of problems, uh, people have been turning a lot more towards the virtual directories. And, and, and really, some of the benefits of these virtual directories are exactly uh, that you really can have um, a lot of dynamic and temporary views of the data. So what this means is that you can create uh, multiple views into the same data uh, without having to map modify the back end or do a lot of hocus pocus uh, in administering a virtual directory. So virtual directories really are, you can think of them as proxies that look at back end information in LDAP, uh, SQL databases, Oracle databases, uh, so any other source, there's a number of connect connectors to back-end data sources. And they do aggregation, consolidation, and, and really uh, provide a unified view to any kind of a calling application. And that, call, that view can be either an LDAP view or can be a, an RDB MS SQL view to the data. So it's basically information as a service. You can think of, of, of virtual directories as information as a service. And they pull data real time from back-end. They can do a lot of um, data transformations, i.e., on the fly, transfer the data, make changes to the data as this as it is represented. So maybe if you have a phone number stored in an obscure format in the back end um, and has a lot of parentheses and dashes in it, you can remove those things and represent the phone number in a, in a much simpler way in, in a view, right? Obviously, you can do a lot of logging with these directories, so you can you can create a lot of logic and also logging. So when someone is accessing a critical piece of data, you can do a lot of uh, additional logging that would not be available when if you were just using a normal directory or a meta directory. Uh, obviously, one of the biggest benefits of virtual directories is that based on what you have in the context of a call, so what directory tree you're looking up, or what attribute value you're finding in, in a backend repository that's being requested, you can clearly do data transformations on, on the channel and provide uh, uh, context and attribute value sensitive data. So basically, the data can change uh, depending on what the, or the view can change depending on what the value of an attribute is in the back end. And that's very important. So you can do groupings. You can in implement a lot of business logic for uh, consolidation and, and integration of, of various user repositories. And it's obviously very important when you do things like uh, the merger and acquisition kind of activity. Obviously, there's no need to move and recertify data out there. It's very important that you don't have to do any kind of data recertification. You can represent multiple schemas. And, and one of the most important things is that you can decouple provisioning from application development. Because virtual directories are read-write instances. You can create, you can use the provisioning application to write to your virtual directory, which then will convey the change and push out the change to the actual endpoint. So you can really decouple the provisioning process from the application development process and how that data is represented in the backend repositories. There's other benefits, things like filtering on who can access what and why, and from what IP address, um, what they can see uh, through the virtual directory. You can limit your the scope of your searches through through a virtual directory, and you can obviously mask some of the data out. So you can do a number of transformations online uh, with a virtual directory. So what are some of the some of the uh, uh, some of the challenges with virtual directories? One of the things that we've seen is that the first item is obviously the same with the benefits section and the challenges, that it's almost too dynamic and too flexible. And you can create a lot of temporary views out there. And things 
um, these views are meant to be temporary, but they really stay forever. So uh, virtual directories are, are great for a temporary consolidation of directories while you come to agreement as to how you should really migrate data. But a lot of times, they just stay there forever. Right? So these views and, and, uh, and various transformations may stay there forever and, and prevent the organization from rethinking their, their true uh, directory consolidation strategy. Uh, a lot of times, if you have unstable backends, a lot you can have problems with uh, real-time data propagation. Obviously, anytime there's a query against an attribute that comes from a backend source, you have to re-query the backend or or do some cache updates. Uh, obviously, for the view definitions, what people see on the front, it, it can grow, and you have to be trimming them. And a lot of people have not been paying a lot of attention to trimming the views that a virtual directory can provide. Obviously. You need to pay attention to what happens if you have conflicting information, so coming from two backends. So you may be uh, reconciling an HR repository and um, a, an active directory, and you have a conflict of phone numbers. The question is, which phone number are you going to represent and, view, and, and make available in a view on the virtual directory? There are some issues. And if you want to make a write, are you going to write it to just one of the backends, or, or are you going to write it uh, to both of the backends? So these are some of the questions that come up all the time. And there is always a debugging of attribute origins, right? So you will always have some level of, of understanding and, and logging, digging in log files to see where that particular attribute value really, really came from. Obviously, it's not a not a solution for instable backend directories. So you have some directories that are not always available. It's not a good idea to use them with virtual directories. And obviously, ownership, as with any other directory infrastructure, has been a problem. Um, really, who owns the virtual directory is a good question. So I'd like to pause here for a moment and really ask you about you know what are the, some of the main drivers. Uh, for using a virtual uh, for using a virtual directory, so if A is a merger and acquisition. Two is compliance, regulatory compliance, security for data is C, and IT administration automation, so changes and, and really benefits in automating IT administration. And I believe twenty seconds is that right? That's right. Okay, so the results are in. Uh, we have 22% for uh, mergers and acquisitions. Uh, interestingly, nobody is using these for compliance. 15% of the respondents are using it for uh, security data, and 63% of people use, the, use uh, virtual directories for IT administration automation. And clearly. Uh, really, if you need to make a change in one place, uh, i.e., in with some interface or provisioning solution that makes a write to a virtual directory and that basically spans out to all the backends, right? That's what that's what really means in, in a, a big benefit in IT administration automation. Finally, uh, let me talk about some of the recommendations, some of the things that we've seen um, being very useful when using virtual directories. So. One of the things is really to keep the big identity and access management picture in mind. Um, obviously, directories, virtual directories, are, are the directory infrastructure or user repository infrastructure for identity and access management solutions. So you basically, they they don't exist because they're cool to have. They exist because they serve applications and user repositories and, and users authenticate and authorize against them. So always keep that in mind. Make sure that you have a concise strategy and a big um, overarching strategy for creating a good identity and access management um, uh, roadmap uh, moving into the future. Having said that, it's almost very important to have a steering board uh, to manage the schema, manage the virtual directory, manage the aggregation points. And usually we see IT, IT security, application developers, networks folks, and a lot of times HR. Uh, human resources representatives sitting on the steering board, and a lot of times even business, if they manage any kind of aspects of contractors, we see people sitting on this uh, directory steering board. Uh, 
Creating a, a static document, basically, that says, hey, this is our standard guidelines around directory schema design. This is our standard guidelines are for what technologies we can use in this environment is really not going to cut it. Right? Um, you have to have live dialogue and conversation and discussion in the enterprise every two weeks or every uh, every month as to how you want to evolve your identity management and virtual directory infrastructure. Obviously, you have to define very clearly who has ownership and who has responsibility for for data propagation paths for write access. Obviously, if people write the virtual directories, you have a, you have you can create a pretty massive situation fairly quickly when you create writes to backends that should not be written. Right. Um, a lot of times, we see that. Um, the performance requirements and the nature of the data really dictates how you should uh, use and what mix you should use uh, virtual directories with meta directories. A lot of times, uh, we see that passwords and instable backends uh, should be represented in meta directories. They should be synchronized. Versus, if you have a lot, uh, if you have a, a a lot of static data and large volumes of data. They really should be virtualized. You shouldn't be moving that kind of information uh, to uh, the wire every night. Obviously, a piece of advice here that we heard from a lot of IT clients is using multiple linking values for a DN. So basically determining who's who in what directory and linking them together. There's a lot of logic you can use in the virtual directories to link these things together. But at the end of the day, it all comes down to some linking keys in these various backend repositories that you can use to attach data together. And you may have to have more than one uh, across the enterprise, more than one uh, a linking attribute across the enterprise. And finally, this is something that you know, always comes up. Um, you know, a virtual directory or a meta directory is really a wrapper around the directory infrastructure. And it has its purposes. It has a lot of benefits and merits. But it's really not a replacement for a, for a directory schema design, a good one. Uh, with the stewardship governance and, and directory reconciliation. So basically, the fewer directory backends you're going to have, the lower your administrative costs are going to be, which is really something that a, a lot of people, you know, mentioned here. Uh, what, you know, when they said that 63% of people use um, directories and virtual directories for IT administration and automation. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Conclude my part of this presentation and hand it back to Lisa. Thanks, Andrash. Uh, we're just getting ready for Lisa's presentation. Stay tuned. Here we go. OK. Can everybody see my screen just to make sure technology is working for me? Yeah. I guess Andrash is the only one that can respond since everyone else is muted, huh? Yes, this is perfectly fine. You can go ahead. That looks great. Thank you. <laughs> Well, now that Andres has given you the background on the importance of and evolution of directories, I'd like to take a look at and actually analyze the complex identity integration challenges that companies are facing and why these challenges require more than what a meta directory or a virtual directory proxy can offer. Security integration and identity dissemination are huge challenges inside the enterprise. We've seen these challenges specifically for projects involving web access management, federation, and collaboration, just to name a few. These challenges revolve around authentication and authorization. And what is at the core of that? Your identities. Inside the enterprise, identities are spread across many data silos and managed by the business units in which they pertain to. You have identities defined and used by the sales department, support, marketing. Each has their own definition of an identity. As you move towards services across the internet with things like cloud computing, you then need to integrate with identities outside the enterprise, your partners, your suppliers, etc. Each of these data sources contains a piece of a person's identity, 
And this represents a huge data management challenge when you need a complete view of a person. At the end of the day, the significant problem that companies are facing boils down to the integration of these identities. If we take a quick poll to find out actually what data sources um, most of the people store their constituents in. So you have 20 seconds, as Anne had mentioned previously. Looks like we've got some results in. Lisa's going to take us through that. Lisa, yeah, here we go. Uh -huh. oh, great. Forty-five percent use Meta Directory. Or uh, no, sorry, that's the wrong poll. Let me scroll down here. Wrong one. What's missing? Uh, having some issues here. Ah, here we go. Thirty-nine percent LDAP Directory. Thirty-nine percent Active Directory. 19% databases, and 3% web services. So even our audience today uses many different data sources. As a first step, virtualization allows you to at least see the pieces of the identity stored in each data source. Each local store contains certain aspects that can contribute to the global profile. It's like a puzzle with each piece representing a component of an identity. With identity and context virtualization, you have the ability to piece together the puzzle. This allows you to manage the complete global profile while allowing local data sources to maintain control over their individual piece of the identity. The philosophy behind identity and context virtualization is to manage globally and act locally. This philosophy is built on an architecture that involves taking the best aspects of both meta and virtual directories to accomplish the identity integration and build that ideal data source to meet all your authentication and authorization needs. As I mentioned, this is critical for projects around web access management, federation, and even more so when you move into the cloud computing. I came across a recent poll the other day that showed that 30% of enterprises and small to, to medium-sized businesses view security as a top concern in SaaS. 72% believe identity and access management is the key security issue, and 78% of consumers want more control over securing their identity. These numbers tell us that focusing just on security means, strong authentication, digital certificates, encryption, et cetera, it's not enough. Beyond the security means, there's a huge amount of identity data that must first be addressed. The integration of these identities is the ultimate challenge for the cloud. When you need to manage the hundreds of thousands to millions of identities while securing them as close as possible to their authoritative sources, you need a new set of infrastructure services. And here's where identity and context virtualization plays a key role. So at this point, you may be thinking, that's nice, but what does identity and context virtualization do differently? What can it give me that a meta or virtual directory can't in regards to integrating my identities? So let's take a look at a meta directory architecture. First and foremost, meta directories are excellent at synchronization, which makes them very scalable. Everything is centralized, making it easy to replicate, scale, and deliver your data at very high speeds. However, meta directories have failed primarily because centralizing everything is not always possible. In order to have a complete global profile, every aspect about an identity, including the passwords, is synchronized into the central repository. Centralizing everything and creating one static definition of an identity is just not possible. This is due to politics over the definition of an identity. Everyone has their own idea of what that is, in addition to just being a costly and complex synchronization nightmare. 
So meta directories are great for speed and scalability, but centralizing everything is just compounding the problem. On the other side of the directory spectrum, we have virtual directories. Uh, just for some clarification, what our competition currently refers to as a virtual directory, we call a virtual directory proxy because of its limited remapping and routing capabilities. So when you see virtual directory as a proxy, that is what I'm referring to. With the virtual directory proxy, you have a flexible abstraction layer that logically appears like a single directory. Queries are routed to the appropriate data sources, which allows requests to be handled locally. And this is excellent for credential checking because it allows the authoritative source to enforce the security means. However, because of the flexibility a virtual directory offers, the number of use cases tends to increase dramatically. Everyone sees the benefits and all of a sudden want to include more data sources and more identities. This leads to the question of scalability, which is a piece of a virtual directory proxy architecture that's not complete. Virtual directory proxies with their query path through their routing approach, it won't scale for large numbers of data sources and identities. The search alone required to identify a user, which is the first step in the authentication process, you need to find the guy, it's not scalable as the number of data sources increases. Since you don't know where this user exists, every backend must be searched. So a single search to the virtual directory to find a user results in one search for every backend. As the number of data sources increases, so does the number of required searches, which puts more load on your backend. In addition, there's the problem of how overlapping identities are handled. What happens when the same user is found in more than one source? Virtual directory proxies don't offer a scalable solution to this. To address the different use cases and environments, we actually offer two editions of our product. The proxy edition is geared toward projects with smaller numbers of entries, less than 200,000, and not too many data sources, most of which are directories. Context edition, on the other hand, is geared toward more large-scale deployments, multiple distributed heterogeneous data sources and large numbers of entries. Typically, when the number of data sources and entries increases, the possibility of having that overlap I mentioned goes up as well, which will require the need for correlation. With this approach, companies can purchase what they need. They may start with proxy edition, and as their needs increase, upgrade to the more scalable context edition. Delivering the best of both worlds. Now that we reviewed the strengths and weaknesses in meta directory and virtual directory proxy architectures, I want to focus on identity and context virtualization. Identity and context virtualization is something different. As I mentioned, it uses the best aspects of meta directories and virtual directories. This involves managing the core identity globally by maintaining a reference list which is a unique index of all identities. The storage of the reference list is accomplished by using our unique, mech or our unique persistent caching mechanism. And this allows for scalability. The idea of storing aspects of a user profile centrally is where the meta directory got it right. This allows for that fast, scalable architecture. However, not every aspect of a user should be stored in the center. When it comes to credential checking, this should be delegated back to the authoritative sources. This is the part that the virtual directory proxies got right, having local data sources in charge of that security means. The idea of manage globally and act locally, that is the philosophy behind identity and context virtualization, is actually a pattern you see often. For example, in things such as DNS and even in search engines like Google. Storing a global reference list and index centrally while allowing certain aspects to be handled locally. So computer name to IP address translation for DNS, or keyword search to specific website for Google, or in the case of Radiant One, a global identifier linking to a local identifier. So let's take a look at how this actually works. In the first step, 
each data source is analyzed and the identities are correlated. This is a critical step in properly handling any overlapping entries, and this is one of the capabilities that a virtual directory proxy lacks. The same user may be identified differently in each source. So for example, I may have Lorena Callahan in source one, uh, Lauren Callahan in source two, and she's identified as Laura Callahan in source three. You need to correlate the identity so that this user is only in your reference list once, since it represents the same person. The result of the correlation process is a complete, unique reference list that is then stored in persistent cache and managed globally. Finally, with the reference list, it's used as a basis for linking to the local identity and building the global profile. For authentication, Radiant One uses the global profile, the global, excuse me, the global reference list, to uniquely identify a person. So as I mentioned, this is the first step in authentication. Because of this global list, the location of the identity is known, so there's no need to search in all the data sources to find the user. Next, the credential check is delegated to the local data source on the back end the second step in authentication. So first you need to locate the user. This is done with the global reference list. And then you need to verify the credentials. And this is enforced by the appropriate backend. So this architecture is a combination of the best qualities that we discussed about a meta directory and a virtual directory proxy. As you move past authentication for authorization, when a richer, more contextual profile is required, the global reference list is used as a basis for retrieving all other aspects about a user's profile. This is group memberships, attributes, etc. This information is pulled from the local data sources. Also, when companies are ready to move toward a security means that's stronger than simple users and passwords, with things like InfoCard and OpenID, for example, the ability to have a complete global profile is essential. So with Radiant One, you get complete identity integration by implementing the best aspects of both meta and virtual directories. And as a result, you have a flexible layer in place to address authentication and authorization challenges. With Radiant One, you're, you're investing in a product that not only solves the complex integration challenges you face today, but it's the foundation that for things such as cloud computing that you will need in the future. Okay. I'd like to thank everyone for attending, and I see some questions coming in from the audience. So let's take some time now to address them. First question, um, what data sources are you able to connect to? The answer to that, um, anything that can be reached through LDAP, JDBC, or as a web service. Anything reachable, if you have a, a custom data source with a, a Java API, we can also customize calls to that as well. Question, can applications access your server with something other than LDAP, like SQL, for example? The answer to that is yes. Uh, we have a built-in SQL interface that comes with the Radiant One Identity and Context Virtualization product, um, as well as a built-in web server, so we can accept the SML request. How is access to your server secured? Do you support SSL? Yes, uh, both SSL and TLS are supported. Um, in addition, our server can enforce mutual authentication. So if you want to require the client to present a valid certificate before accessing the server, that is supported as well. Um, you can also, also access our server as a Kerberos service. So if you are authenticating via a Kerberos, Kerberos ticket, if that's in your environment, that's supported also. Let's see. Second here, I'm scrolling through the question. Um, what is the definition of context virtualization? Context is the 
entire aspect about an identity. So it's not just the user identifier and the, the credential that they're going to use to authenticate. Context is everything else about that person. This may be, like I mentioned, certain aspects for authorization, group membership, um, other attributes you may want to base authorization on, maybe their um, gold star status or their certain title of a person may have authorization to access certain information that others may not. In addition, this could mean something um, not necessarily directly related to a user, but to their role. So if a person is a sales manager in an organization and they follow certain customers, who order certain products. This information about customers and products that they've purchased is also data in your data silos. However, the complete context about a salesperson isn't just their password and their username. It's also, like I mentioned, customers pulled from the customer database and the product customer purchased pulled from the product database. So the entire aspect about an identity is considered the context virtualization. I see there are many other questions right now, but we're running short on time. Um, whatever we don't get addressed in the webinar, we'll be sure to follow up after. So I just want to thank everyone again for attending, and we hope to see you again in a future webinar. Thanks, everyone. Uh, we will be sending you a link to the slides and recording from today's session. Big thanks to Andres Chair from Forrester for holding his insights today, and also to Lisa Grady for giving us the overview on identity and context virtualization. You can learn, learn more about that on our website at radiantlogic.com. And a very special thanks to all of you for joining us today. Have a great day.